Hello, everyone. This is Al Fadi, and I want to welcome you back to a continuation of this fascinating uh, video series on uh, the possible origin of the Quran. Today, we are actually going to take a look at allegedly the originator of the idea of collecting the Quran. And we're talking about Umar, who became, according to the standard Islamic narrative, the second caliph. Uh, among the righteous caliphs of Islam after Muhammad. Uh, the, the traditions say that he was the one who prompted Abu Bakr to collect the Quran for the first time. It was his daughter Hafsa that happened to be one of the wives of Muhammad that preserved that copy. But there are also holes in this particular narrative. However, I mean, I will interact right now with our guest concerning that because he's going to bring in even another angle that might be foreign to many of you. I may even get surprised by some of the stuff that he might be sharing. With us here, of course, in studios to unpack all of this is no other than Dr. Jay Smith. So, Jay, hmm. tell us about Omar. Right. And I, I want to say something before we even get into this. And this is all what we call green papers. What do I mean by that? A green paper is what they use in Britain when the government wants to put something out there to see what hot people think. There's also what they call white papers, but the green papers are the first initial material they put out there and they try to get a reaction to see whether or not this makes sense. And in some ways, that's what we're doing with this new material. We're not sure yet how it happened because we don't know really where the Quran came from. But we now think we now think we are starting to get some ideas of where possible where it could have come from. And we need to set, we need to connect the dots. That will probably take another two or three years before we do that. But nonetheless, in 2022, what are we saying? What are we looking at? Well, in 2022, this is what we know. So I'm putting the date there. So if in 2024 and 2025, Jay, you said this. So, or uh, Al Fadi, you said this. You're changing your story. Yes, we're going to have to, depending on what the evidence shows. Yeah, that's but scholarship. We, we need to go back to the 7th century, and that's what we've always done. We always want to go and find out what was happening in the 7th century. And in the 7th century, we do have a man named Umar. Now, don't get confused with Umar the Caliph. That's not Umar the second Caliph, that the standard Islamic narratives. In fact, the standard Islamic narrative Umar lived way down in Medina. This guy did not live in Medina. He actually came from Hira, which is in Iraq, which is today Kufa just south of Baghdad today, which used to be called Stesiphon back then. Mm -hmm. And he was a Jew. He was not a Muslim. However, in 647, he commissioned a coin. And the coin had, uh, in 647, has a na name Mahmud on it. It's a coin that was commissioned by Umar. Uh, it's an image of a king. It's probably his image. And he has a cross in his hand. Hmm. What does that suggest if he has a cross in his hand? Well, I mean, the cross, of course, represents Christianity. So this is a Christian king. Right. Oh, that's interesting. Why would someone be calling Muhammad? Why would he have the word Muhammad there if he's a Christian king? Can you see there's a problem there? Right. So this has been causing a lot of problems for the numismatists. Numismatists are experts in coins, and they are the ones who are having to look at these coins. And they're trying to do what Van Putin did at the beginning of the series. They're trying to take the standard Islamic narrative, and they're trying to put it into these coins here. And they're finding a problem here because it just doesn't make sense. You can't have a Muslim Umar who is down in Medina with a cross in his hand right. and referring to Muhammad. It, that just, doesn't doesn't make sense. it just doesn't make sense. So you've mean. got to find out what's going to come out, uh, what it's going to be sifted through. You have to sift it. And what you sift is what just follow the coins. Just follow what's happening back then. And what we do know is that this Umar in 644 had a debate. And he had a debate with a guy named John the Settler. This debate... Um, uh, after it, uh, this John the Setter, he, he then made and met, uh, he was, at this time, he was debating about this diatessaron. The diatessaron is what? Do you know anything about the diatessaron written by Tatian? Well, that, that's basically the harmony of the Gospels. You take the four Gospels put together like in a, you know, one full story, technically speaking. Okay. He lost this debate to John the Setter, and he was given this diatessaron. Now, diatessaron would have been written in Syriac. Right. So it's a Syriac copy of this Tatian, what Tatian put together uh, as a compilation of the four Gospels. Mm -hmm. He then met a guy named Gabriel and got really influenced by this Gabriel, who was a priest. 
He comes into Jerusalem and conquers Jerusalem in 638. Now, that's all historical. That's very well known. Sophronius is the bishop there. He wants him to go to the Church of the Sepulchre and pray with him as the conquering hero. And he says, no, 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 no. I, you know, I don't want to desecrate because I'm a Jew. It wouldn't be good for me going to this. So what does he do? He goes right up to the Temple Mount. Oh, that's interesting. Well, for a Jew, that's very important. Because of course. Why would that be important for a Jew? Well, the Temple Mount represent a whole lot of things. I mean, a uh, place of sacrifices, you know, a uh, holy of holies, and, and many other things. He wants to basically go back to where the, David's temple was, which is right. on Mount Moriah, which right. we now know as Marwa in Safa. Marwa yeah. is where the Dome of the Rock sits. If you want to look where it is today, it's where the Dome of the Rock sits. But remember, the Dome of the Rock was not written, was not built until 691. So we're back in 638. He goes and he builds a structure there. He and Gabriel get along really well. In fact, he gets very influenced by Gabriel, this priest. And Gabriel gives him a book, and he gives him a part of the Diatessaron, this, this Syriac text. And it's fascinating because it looked like what he gave Umar was, was what then became the Quran later on. So we're talking about the 7th century, and this is what we're looking at. We're zeroing in on this because this is interesting. Now, stop and ask yourself, back in 2015, they came across the Birmingham Folios, which mm -hmm. is three stories, a story of the seven sleepers of Ephesus, the story of James the Lesser, and the story of Moses. Right. Those three stories, 33 verses, are really from the 7th century. They're written in Arabic. They are written uh, in without any dots and no harakats and no ijams, no dots or vowels. So these are the nascent tense. And, of course, into the, 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 the dating of the, uh, the carbon dating, radiocarbon dating, they went. They would go from uh, 568 to 645. So that's about the time of Muhammad. So it's about the time of what we're talking about because that would cover what Umar is doing. That would cover the same time period that Umar. It could be that these very three stories were part of that nascent text. Right. But they're nothing to do with the Quran, are they? Well, they are today, but they're nothing to do with Islam. Maybe I mean, that's a better way to say it. At least uh, those stories uh, are affiliated with a Christian you know, type of um, heritage. Exactly. Now, this Jew who was given this book in 638 coins this coin in 647. What happened between 638 and 647? It looks like he became a Christian. Looks like he was converted. We don't know because there's not enough that we can say. But I'm assuming, and this is me saying this, I'm assuming that it was because of Gabriel that he was converted. Nonetheless, by the time of 647, when he coined this coin, he now is a Christian because he has a cross now. He's no longer a Jew. He's now a Christian. Mm -hmm. And he now introduces the praised one. Who do you think the praised one would be in this context? Well, in this context, uh, it doesn't sound like it's Muhammad. Uh, we're talking about a different person. It looks like it is possibly Jesus Christ. I'm assuming this is the praised one. They're referring to the person of Jesus Christ. And from a Christian standpoint, it makes sense. It makes sense. Yeah. So this happens in 647. Now... Let's now turn to the 9th and 10th century when you get to the standard Islamic narrative. What does the standard Islamic narrative say? This Muhammad receives a text from Gabriel. That's right, which is an angel. And who is the Gabriel in the 7th century? He's a priest. The one you mentioned is a priest. His name is Gabriel as well. Right. But this priest in the 7th century gives a text to Umar, a different person who refers to himself as or refers to Muhammad on this coin. Can you see they've taken what you, was probably an original uh, original story, which did exist and has been passed down, had been recounted orally over the centuries, because now we're into the 8th century going into the 9th century. So 200 years later, the story about Gabriel, the priest who gives this book, the Diatessaron, to this conqueror of Jerusalem, uh, whose name is Umar. Mm -hmm. Now that becomes to, instead of a priest who is Gabriel, it becomes the angel who is Gabriel, who then gives the text to the new Muhammad, the 9th and 10th century narrative, the standard Islamic narrative Muhammad. And that Muhammad doesn't live in Jerusalem. He lives in Mecca and Medina, way down in the Hejaz, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. when we know that there is no Mecca that early. Medina, yes, it was called Yathrib. So even the name is wrong and the place is wrong. This is what we're starting to see. We're starting to see kernels of truth that are there in the 7th century that are then embellished and changed using sometimes the same name and introduced as another narrative by the 9th and 10th century. Hold on to that because that's going to become important as we now move into the next episodes.
One last question before we wrap this up. Someone might ask, so where did we get this information from about the Omar and the priest Gabriels? I want you just to reiterate it one more time for people to know that there are sources that you're uh, basically referring to. Oh, these to. are all sources well known. These are sources yeah. from, these are the, the, do, the documents that are written. Uh, this is in uh, the, um, uh, Robert Hoyland's book. Got it. Islam as uh, uh, seeing Islam seeing as other, other side as other side means yeah. looking outside of the tradition and seeing what we really know from the seventh century. Now, what Robert Hoyle did in 1997, he took all the stories that existed in that area, that are from the seventh century mm -hmm. and the eighth century, not from the ninth and tenth century. He wanted to see what actually was what we have on the ground. This story is in his book on. Right. Hoyland's book that came out in 1997. And that's a very scholarly book, of course. I mean, we're not talking about uh, just uh, mediocre amateur writing. It's here. a treasure trove. Absolutely. Absolutely. I have it on my shelf. Uh, you know, so that's great. Thank you so much, uh, brother. Uh, next time, I guess we are going to start to venture into the resm and the dotting and the vowel markings and so on and so forth. Now we're going to move into the 8th century and say what happened then with that original text? What then went wrong? To assist in reading it, actually. There you go. Yeah. Well, everyone, hopefully yeah, you've been uh, tracking along with us and hopefully you have been enjoying everything that we presented to you. As always, we welcome any of your comments and interactions with us. Until we meet again next time, have a blessed day. Thank you for watching this video. Be sure to like and subscribe to our channel, Sierra International, and click on the bell so that you receive notifications whenever we publish a new video or go live. I would also like to appeal to you to consider becoming a Patreon patron by clicking the link right below. By doing so, you can give towards the production of these videos. There are also other options for you where you can give to our channel. I thank you from the bottom of my heart.